Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Welcome. It's great to have everybody back out. You know, it comes and it goes as to how often we can get out in public together, and it's great to uh, be here tonight. My name is Matt Rodolsky. I'm the president of Brantford Historical Society. And as I was thinking about this presentation and driving home through Short Beach tonight, I looked out at the beautiful fog shrouded waters and the rocky islets and all of that. And I thought, boy, I would have hated to be a sailor back in the 1500s and 1600s with no radar, nothing fancy like that. When I served in the Navy, we had all sorts of fancy things. But when you think about the Dutch fort, think about how people got there, how they got out of there, and all the different ships of different nations are out there vying for supremacy in Long Island Sound at the time. So that's the background historical context that I'm sure you're going to hear about from our speaker as well. And uh, at this point, uh, if you're, I will say, if you're not a member of the Brantford Historical Society, do please join up. It's a nominal $20 annual membership for an individual. It helps support the things we do, like bringing all of our public school third graders into Harrison House every single year now that we're past COVID and telling them what life would have been like for them in 1724. Believe me, they are shocked when they find out that they would have maybe one set of clothes and it would probably be hand-me-downs. So uh, enjoy the program. I'll conclude my remarks here and I'll introduce Sue Winkle, who is our program chair, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you all for being here tonight. Hello, everyone. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight, Jim Powers, who will be talking about the discovery of the Dutch Ford on Indian Neck. As a historian, an author, and an educator for 40 years, Jim has a passion for researching and sharing his knowledge of early American history and Native American life and culture. Jim helped establish and is a founding member of the Quinnipiac Donlin Museum at the Dudley Farm in Guilford, where he serves currently as a member of the board. His latest book, Shadow Over Don Donland, is a historical novel that tells the story of the first 50 years of English Quinnipiac interaction through the eyes of a Quinnipiac shaman. In addition, Jim is also the author of several nonfiction books on topics associated with historical events and developments in Connecticut history. In other words, he's a really busy guy. <laughs> Today, Jim will be talking to us about his participation in an archaeological dig right here in Brantford. Please join me in welcoming Jim Powers. Well, so, such a nice uh, introduction. I hope I don't disappoint you, <laughs> but we'll, we'll see from there. Um, one of the one of the things about um, well, I'm a re as a retired teacher. One of the things that I, I really enjoy about my retirement is being able to really dive into. Um, topics and issues that have always always intrigued me from the historical point of view. Um, and um, the Dutch Fort is one that is really kind of special and uh, because what it what our discovery of the Dutch Fort really sort of overturned centuries of, of uh, the concept of, of what was actually going on here in Connecticut in regard to not just the Dutch and the English, but also how it impacted the indigenous community here, um, not just here in Totucket and the Quinnipiac people, but throughout throughout the region. And so I'm really happy to be able to come here and sort of tell the, tell the story of how we found the Dutch fort and what types of things actually proved, at least to us, that it was, was a, an early Dutch fort. So. Hopefully I'll push the right button. Oops. Um, back when we first started doing the presentation for this, the stig was back in 1998-99 and we finished up with some auxiliary digging in 2000. Um, we, it was really important for us to point out that yes, this was a dig um, sponsored by um, Wesleyan University, uh, the graduate program. Um, there at the time, but it was also a dig sponsored by the Brantford Historical Society, and the entire community got involved, which was really an incredible thing. Um, my experience with most archaeological digs is we kind of do them on the side without really much public uh, interest, and this is one that seemed to really captivate the public here in uh, 
<laughs> in uh, Brantford. As a matter of fact, I remember sometimes I had to stop working on the dig to, to actually be a PR person, sort of explaining to people who wandered in. And one of the nice things about it is it took place on two properties. One was the Owen Ego Inn property, and the other one was their, uh, the, the uh, a private home um, right next door, at, at that time owned by um, Chet and Angelica Bentley. Um, and they they were so incredible about letting just people walk up their driveway and and, and get involved and 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 it was really sort of a special uh, dig from that point of view. But really, the the what I want to also talk about is this: um, when I first started teaching in Guilford back in the Stone Age, um, I would very often hear rumors about Branford. And of course, you know how Guilford and Branford students always have had sort of a rivalry thing going, and that's you know, and that's healthy, I guess. But these rumors had to do with the fact that because Guilford's so proud of their history, you know, and, and their colonial homes and the Whitfield Museum and all that, um, they would always sort of mention on the sly, do you know that people in Branford think that the Dutch were there before the English? And, you know, no, that couldn't be possible, could it? And it was always one of those myths um, in the oral traditions that were passed down from year to year to year. And I'm sure some of you probably heard this story if you were in a resident of uh, uh, of um, Branford prior to when we did the dig, you probably heard this maybe growing up. Um, but one of the things about, the, about world history, the older I get as a historian and as an archeologist, the older I get, I realize that you can't dismiss oral history necessarily. It can be embellished and be 90% incorrect. Um, it could be even 95% incorrect. But for the most part, if it has legs, if it has a lasting sort of story to it, there's gotta be something to it. And I'll use as an example this. I'm not sure if you folks know what that picture is behind me here. But that's the an early picture of a Viking settlement in, in Newfoundland. For centuries, the, uh, you know, based on the um, Icelandic sagas, you know, Eric the Red and all that, there were always these stories that the Vikings actually discovered America around, well, let's see, near 1,000, but there was never any proof until in the 1950s, archeologically proof was found. And it's in La, my French is horrible, La, 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 La Meadow, whatever, whatever it is, but um, it's in north, Northwestern uh, Newfoundland. And that set, the, that set the history of North America topsy-turvy, because we all know it was Christopher Columbus, right, who discovered America. But yet here's, here's proof that the Vikings um, were in fact in, um, in Newfoundland, um, which is in the Canadian Maritimes, I'll show you a map in a second, um, around the year 1000. Um, we also know that they lived in Greenland from around the year nine, well, Eric the Red, discovered Greenland in 982 AD, and they didn't leave or disappear from Greenland until 1350. So they were in Greenland for all those years, certainly probably drive, sailing back and forth to um, Newfoundland and Labrador because of the issue associated with one thing that they required that they didn't have in Greenland. Does anybody want to guess? Wood. You know, and they built wooden sailing ships, so they needed to have a source of wood, and uh, so they, they probably moved back and forth. Um, I've since learned um, that within the last five years, two more sites have been found in Newfoundland, in the southern part of Newfoundland. One is actually an iron furnace that they believe that the uh, the Vikings actually had there. So the more people look into these these stories, the more and, and do their research and, and archaeology helps along, certainly, the more you're you're starting to get an idea as to what happened. Now that gets us to this lovely picture. I love this thing. This is a Viking coin. You want to know where it was found? Anybody want to guess, guess Branford? No, not not Branford. <laughs> It was actually found in the Kennebec River in Maine. 
Um, so, you know, and of course, there's always been stories along the shoreline here that the Vikings came down uh, along the Connecticut shore and blah, blah, blah. Any, any of you familiar with the quarries over at, uh, you know, the Stony Creek area and uh, that section of Guilford over there, too. There's always a story that the Vikings did a lot of the carvings and the stones and things, but who knows? But we do know that the Vikings, not just Eric the Red, but there were other Vikings who kind of traveled back and forth. And this is just sort of a map that we put together back in 1998, 99, just kind of shows, you know, they were moving back and forth. And then one of the things that's kind of fun about it, trying to get my, my zapper here, is like, you know, here we are down here. You know, it's not too fanciful an idea to think that maybe they might have come here. But anyway. What were the Vikings doing here? Well, amongst other things, um, they were probably off Newfoundland fishing, if they were, if anything. But we now know, historically, we can kind of put the Vikings to the side for a minute and start about his talk about historically is probably as early as the late 1300s. Um, fishermen, Basque fishermen from that, and Galician fishermen from northern Spain, and uh, Breton fishermen from Brittany and France. Um, we now know that they were coming off the, the uh, what's now the Grand Bakes, all, all through here, and they were fishing. And like any good fisherman, they always go home and tell where they're getting their, their catches, right? And what were they looking for? Well, they were looking for cod, that lovely little fish that really transformed Europe uh, during this time period, start, starting in the 1300s. Um, cod, when the first explorers came off the shores of, of our part of North America, um, the English actually talked about the fact that you could get out of your ship and when the cod were migrating, you could actually walk across the water on top of the cod, there were so many, okay? Now, if you go to the store to buy cod, oops, okay, you know what that's like. But um, they were coming here to, to fish cod. Now, by here, I mean off the coast of north, northeastern North America. And the reason why is because uh, cod was seen as a, as a serious staple back in Europe, Ireland, England, Scotland, France, Germany, the, North, the uh, Scandinavian countries, France, Spain, Portugal. And this is, I love this picture because this is an artist's rendition of what would happen, okay? Because once you got over, over here and you had to, had to, you caught all that cod, you were gonna put it on ice and bring it to sail all the way back to, uh, Europe, right? That wasn't going to happen. Um, you had to you had to come up with a way of preserving the cod, and there were two basic ways that they would do it. One was they would land on 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 shore, and they would smoke the cod, which was a a standard way of drying the cod out and preserving it. Then they would pack it in barrels, and then those bar you know once the once the hold was full. Uh, they would sail back to uh, wherever they came from in Europe, uh, crossing the the, the, the uh, North Atlantic. And this this image shows you you know the smoke rising and the the ship sort of sort of anchored off off of it. But but the the issue here is that they they had to land, and when they landed along the shore, let's say of Newfoundland or Labrador, or Nova Scotia or Maine. Uh, maybe even Cape Cod, they had to, they certainly interacted with the native people. There's no doubt about it. And as a matter of fact, there's a lot of a lot of uh, historical record about issues associated with uh, conflicts with the native people in Newfoundland uh, with these fishermen. Um, and here's some an example of some dried cod. Um, you know, they would. You know, this is a, a, an example from the point of view of a Native American. Uh, example or a display of it but you can see the size of the cod that they were probably catching and you know and after you smoked it and dried it um it, it, was, it was really really hard um and you know it's really really solid um when you got back to europe you know once you sold the cod you know the first thing that people would have to do if they wanted to eat it was to soak it to you know to loosen it up and it was fine um, this is just a little um, sort of a fun little picture showing once again um, 
Newfoundland. But the thing was um, the area where we the earliest known Euro, uh, European um, area here um, where there's a, the remains of a Portuguese settlement dedicated to, uh, to, to uh, the, the fishery is in that area off of St. Mary's, uh, off the Grand Bay. And the, by the way, the Viking settlement is right up over here too, by the way. And this is a, an image of the uh, archeological dig associated with that, um, the discovery of, of the Portuguese settlement. I'm not sure the date anymore because I haven't checked into it for a while, but supposedly this dates to sometime around 1400, 1420. Now, when you talk about the whole idea of Columbus and you know nobody knew about what was going on over here, well, you got a whole different story when you, when you start to look at what was happening just in Newfoundland alone. The other thing and the more efficient way of dealing with cod was this salt and this is salt is the thing that really kind of revolutionized the this fishery and made it possible for many more europeans to start to come to the fish off the shores of, of, of um, eastern north america the only problem was there were really kind of there was really only one area in europe that produced enough uh, salt to make this viable to carry it across the ocean so that you could then salt the fish. And that was in Western France. And of course, that was great for the French fishermen. But if you were, you know, a Basque or you were Spanish or you were English or even Irish, uh, it wasn't going to, you know, it wasn't going to happen. So it, starting around the time when, when the Spanish began to, um, began to colonize and conquer the Caribbean region, um, that became a, a major salt producing area. And so what would happen is ships would sail down into the Caribbean, load up on, load up on salt, sail up the coast of North America, uh, right, you know, all the way up to uh, the, the, the fishery where they would then use the salt to, uh, to um, dry the fish and preserve it so they could bring it back to Europe. The other thing they needed was this they needed white oak. White oak was the wood of preference for making barrels. It's incredibly um, impervious to moisture. Um, it's incredibly hard. And if you wanted to have a real barrel, the barrel had to be into preserved fish or really almost anything else. It had to be made out of white oak. This was, this really got us thinking in regard to the, the Dutch fort. And, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. But white oak up until, well, I don't know since climate change what's happening, but uh, it, it, in the late 1990s, early 2000s, the Northern uh, range of white oak was a little North of Portland, Maine. After that, white oak simply sort of disappeared. You still had the other species of oak, in red oak, et cetera. And, but um, the farther north you got, the more uh, less deciduous trees you got in general and the more conifers you had. So this meant that if you wanted to make barrels, um, it would be great if you could take them with you from Europe. The problem was Europe was in a drought of timber. They had pretty much, the Europeans had pretty much eliminated their major source of timber during the their early, earlier Middle Ages. And one of the things that blew them away when they started coming over here were, were, were simply the trees. And if you read early accounts, especially of the Engl early Englishmen who came here, that's what they talked about, the immense, immense trees. Um, over at the Dawnland Museum, we have a... Um, a, a, a reproduction um, dugout canoe, native dugout canoe, it was actually made by a gentleman from, uh, from Brantford here, Peter de Ross. And it's, it's small, it's only about 12 feet long. But John Winthrop, the first governor, John Jr., the first governor of Connecticut, 
and his writings recorded that on Long Island Sound, he saw a dugout canoe with 30 men in it. Can you imagine the size of that tree? And that's what these people coming over from Europe with a, uh, a tree deprived environment were saying, whoa, okay, we got some trees here. And of course, if they wanna make barrels, they're gonna go to where the white oaks are. And what they would do is they would produce the barrels in pieces like this and, and, bat, and, and box or bundle them up and send them. Um, these are actual barrel stays that were found during an archeological dig in Newfoundland. And guess what kind of oak, oak it is? White oak. This gets us to Branford. Now we all know we're all proud that each of our little towns has these wonderful little plaques someplace. And I can't, I think yours is right on the green, right? And it, it tells the story of the settlement of Branford, et cetera, and some of the major things that took place. Now, this was put up, I think, in it says 1981. Um, if you take the time to read it, it tells a story about uh, New Haven County in 1638 uh, purchasing this land from the native people. Um, they got a lot of that information wrong, but that's okay. Um, they, you know, the fact that they sort of said it was important. Uh, they talk about the first um, iron ironworks in Connecticut here in 1655, et cetera. But there's no mention really of the Dutch. And one reason why there's no mention of the Dutch is because, as, as you probably all know, the hi history is written by those who in the end prevail, okay? And as uh, John, Dr. John Pfeiffer, um, who I was involved with this dig with, and I got more and more into the story, we started to realize that the accounts of the Dutch in Connecticut by the early English settlers were really sort of expunged or, I mean, they would mention them on occasion when they really had to, like, you know, when they didn't want them cutting, guess what anymore, timber anymore, but they are, uh, but they, but there really is hardly any account uh, from the English side in terms of where the Dutch actually were. This is one of my favorite images and I don't know if anybody <laughs> knows what it is, but it's, it's actually a map and it's a map of Indian neck. It was produced by um, Yale's president in the mid to late 1700s, Ezra Stiles. Ezra Stiles was a compulsive journaler. He was also president of Yale in New Haven, but he was also a minister of a church in Newport. And he would constantly travel back and forth, obviously, along the coast and sometimes inland. And as he went, he wrote down all sorts of things. Um, he identified different things going on in each town. He drew maps. He drew uh, images of, uh, of um, all sorts of things. He talked. He wrote down gossip. He wrote down things that were going on religiously. He talked about how many, um, how many um, slaves were in the community. He also was fascinated with the Native Americans and he tried to document as much as he could about the Native Americans. Now, by this is later, like the late to mid to late 18th century, a lot of the Native Americans in this area were already leaving. They couldn't survive in their traditional way of life and were migrating elsewhere. But he was really careful to, you know, to note all these things down. Well, when he got to Branford, and he decided he was going to um, draw a map like he always did. This is a map of Indian Neck. And, and I'm sorry, because it's not a very good uh, image, but I, I like to show you the original first. In this corner right here, where the neck is the narrowest, he has a little X. And then next to it, he says, Dutch Fort. And this is a one that we recreated. And you, know, you can tell we were doing high tech at the time. We recreated this um, this map to sort of show and interpret what he actually what he was actually saying. Here, once again, is the Dutch fort. The Ministry of Indian Lands say 400 acres. Um, I'm sure you folks know that there was a, a native village here um, called Totucket on um, on Indian Neck. 
And it was the last of the four villages, Quinnipiac villages to actually disappear um, once the English got here. Um, they began selling off pieces of their land to the, the Brantford settlers in the uh, early 1700s. And by 1770, they were pretty much gone and had migrated um, to join other, other native people, uh, leaving the, either leaving the state or merging with others that were still here. But the fact that he wrote that down was really sort of significant. The other thing he, that it was significant was this. Here is the residence of the Totuka tribe. The body of shells on the rocky shore left behind accounts for a most numerous population. This is the greatest body of shells that I've seen between New York and Cape Cod. So, and you can see here's where the shell bank is. What's with the shells? Two things. Number one, shellfish was a staple and a major staple for native people. And as their way of life um, became more and more interfered with by the spread of the English population, it became a major source of protein for them throughout the year. It was also the source of something that both the Dutch and the English wanted. There were small beads made out of whelk shells and quahog shells called wampum. And the Dutch, when they come here, um, this, figure out that native people living in the interior of New England and New York State want wampum. And the reason why they want wampum is these beads would be, would be made into belts or strings that would then be um, woven in a way that would be symbolic, not only uh, of who that person was, but what their heritage was, um, their status in their community and all that sort of thing. So um, the fact that there was a major shell midden here means that the native people of Totucket were producing uh, a lot of wampum at the time when the Dutch arrived, but they were also consuming a lot of uh, shellfish. So here's the story. <laughs> this is an aerial view, as you can tell, of Indian Neck today. The right here is where that's the Owenigo Inn right there. And then this is the Bentley House at the time. You can see just like um, Ezra Stiles, it's on the thinnest part of the, um, of, of, of the peninsula. And what happened is this, John, Dr. John Pfeiffer and I had been going back and forth for many years saying, gosh, wouldn't it be great to find that Dutch for it? You know, and it was always one of those projects that we kind of said, yeah, yeah, we'll get to that thing. Well, there was one of those February, weird February days when it was like sunny and 65 degrees. And um, he called me up and said, let's go find it. And I said, what? Let's go find the Dutch fort. Okay, there you go, I'll meet you. And so, you know, we came down to, to Branford here and um, we made sure that we came during low tide. And you guys know why low tide, because with low tide, you can walk the shore. High tide, you can't because of private property. And so we were walking the shore. Um, we kind of parked in a place illegally, if I remember correctly. Um, and we were walking the shore and we were walking the shore and we looked up right past the Owen Ego Inn. And we were sort of stunned by what we saw from the shore. So we then got all excited, ran back, and we couldn't get into where the Owen Ego was because it was locked but we could sort of peer into way past where the tennis courts are. And we said, oh no, look at that. There's a raised embankment, blah, blah, blah. You got all excited. Well, that didn't turn out to be true, but we, we realized that the next home over um, had a nice long driveway and being the bold archeologists that we are, we said, hey, let's go see if they'll let us look around on their yard, right? And so we went up the driveway and Here's the weird thing. They had a flag pole with a Dutch flag flying. And we knocked on the door and Chet Bentley an answered and Chet said, hi, what can I do for you fellas? And we just, 
I, I don't think he, I don't know how he understood us. We were so excited. But he said, we always heard, you know, we've always heard that the Dutch fort was here somewhere. So we, we get a kick out of flying the flag. Plus my wife's family's part Dutch. So we, we, we just sort of, we sort of fly it there. And um, we said, well, we're, you know, archaeologists, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, we think that you, your property might actually contain the, um, the, the possible remains of, of the Dutch fort. And we explained the whole thing as her styles, et cetera, et cetera. And he's, and he said, well, let me, let me talk to my wife. We'll, we'll think about this. And um, within a week, he got back to John and he said, I, I, if you want, you can, you can, you can take a, take a look. Okay. Now he didn't understand taking a look at archaeology because <laughs> it was a little something, but um, so that so um, that's how it sort of happened. Um, and this is just a little closer view. Once again, this is the Owenigo right here, um, and the, this is all their property um, here. And then there's a hedge here, a great big hedge. Here's the Bentley property. And it turns out the fort was right here. That hedge actually bisected it. Now, for those of you who aren't too uh, too up on your Native Americans in Eng in the United States in, in a Connecticut in 1636, this is a quick primer, um, and it's not really all that accurate either. Because even to this day, we really can't put together a truly accurate map. The only accuracy we have is based on what the English wrote down, which was very fluid and not always very often contradictory. But anyway, um, what we're looking at here this is the Quinnipiac River. So here's New Haven. So we're looking at an area right about here. Now, you may see this name over here, Quirpy. This is the name that the Dutch gave the Quinnipiac. Uh, the Quirpy, because that was the language that they spoke. They actually called themselves the Renapi, which means the people, okay? The name Quinnipiac came about because when the English showed up in New Haven Harbor and said, hey, who are you guys? They said, we're the people of the, of the, of the, uh, of the tidal, long tidal river. And in their language, it basically, the English heard Quinnipiac. So that name sort of stuck. Um, and that's how the name Quinnipiac got to be for these people. Um, this is a really exciting map because of this. Um, this is a Dutch map that was um, put together after, after the explorer Adrian Block came to the coast of Connecticut in 1614. Now, those of you who paid attention to history back when, you know that Henry Hudson was here in what year? <laughs> I didn't expect it. it's okay. <laughs> My students wouldn't answer that anyway either. Uh, 1609, Henry Hudson was here, okay? And he, of course, explored the Hudson River. He didn't go into Long Island Sound because he that meant he would have had to go through Hell's Gate in the eastern end of Long Island Sound. So he didn't do that. He sailed along the South Shore on his way back to, to, uh, to Europe. But when he got back to um, to the Netherlands. Um, the Netherlands, the people in the Netherlands at that point were in the process of fighting for their freedom from the Spanish, but had also for many years by then, but they also had, were developing this incredible global trade network, Africa, India, um, what's now Indonesia, um, it's South America. And it was incredible what they were, what they were doing. And they, a group of merchants in, um, and the Amsterdam in particular said, hey, you know, based on what Hudson found out there, this might really mean something. So they started sending other people out here. And one of those people was um, Adrian Block, who actually ended up sailing here uh, four times. His most famous uh, one was in 1613-14, when he landed on Manhattan Island. Um, his crew, half his crew mutinied and burned his ship and got on this another ship that was also in the area, Dutch ship, um, and sailed away. He was marooned on Manhattan Island for half his crew for that entire winter. And what they did is they built a they built a ship called the Onrust. 
which turned out to be fortunate for us because it was smaller and a ship that was able to sail not only in, into Long Island Sound, but also up some of the estuaries and the rivers. He eventually sailed all the way up past Hartford to where Enfield is and the Enfield Rapids before he had to turn around. And if uh, you want to see a um, reproduction of the on rust, it's at the Connecticut River Museum. It's uh, pretty much a permanent display there until it gets icy, and then I think they sail it away to someplace else. But you'll get the sense of how small it was, um, but also how, such an important ship that, that was here. So, but what Block did, wherever he went, he documented not only who he ran into, the people he saw, what the people were like, how many people he seemed to see, but he also um, named them and he drew maps. Okay, and that, that was really sort of an important thing. And one of the things that he pointed out, and we have this wonderful little black arrow. And of course, you guys can see this little scribble here. Well, that little scribble says, Red red dunes, a uh, road dunes in um, in Dutch, or it translates to the word uh, red dunes. So there was something there in 1614 that caught his attention enough that he would identify it. This is a postcard from the uh, late 1800s, and on the left hand side you may see something. There's a bit of a dune. It's got a little bit of a reddish color to it, right? Um, on the right hand side there is um, what becomes the um, Oni Go In. Okay, and uh, so we, you know, when we saw this, this we said, "Hey, this is really sort of interesting." Because one of the things I didn't tell you about when we were walking along the shore and you know, and looked up and saw where we thought the Dutch fort might be is in front of the Bentley House is a thirty foot drop. It's a thirty foot red dune, which is really kind of cool. Um, this is a, a shot later on in the late 1800s, um, once again, of the Owenigo Inn and the flag, and you can see how the, the height above the, above the shore there, which is, and it's still like that. This is just a little um, sort of a surveyor, the Tom Platt map that shows you, once again, here's the Owenigo, um, here's the Bentley house, and this, this little garage. And the reason why I'm showing you this is because the Fort turns out to be just in this general area here. Um, this is an old cistern that sort of wrecked part of what we found to be the fort. Uh, but this little garage sort of put, pays important uh, and it comes with the, some of the pictures I'll show you. So we said to the Bentleys, okay, what we're gonna do is called test pitting, right? And in the archeology, span when you test pit, what you do is you, you put these small two foot by two foot uh, test pits in the ground about every um, three meters or five or six feet away from each other um, in a line just to sort of see if you hit anything, right? Well, it turns out the very first test pit we put in, we hit something. We had no idea what it was, but you can see we started opening up the pit. Uh, that's that garage that I was pointing out. And we started opening that area up because we said, hey, there's something here and we, we just don't know what it is. We also were test pitting as you see farther up um, towards the shore and then we'll get to that in a minute. Well, this is what we ended up finding once we did the test pit. We were absolutely baffled. Uh, John and I have done prehistoric and historic archeology span for years by then. We were pretty good at knowing what what we were looking at and what we were looking for. We were absolutely stymied by this. We could not figure out what this is. Um, the more we opened it up, it appeared that it was oct octang octagonal in, in shape. Um, and it just, um, it just didn't seem to make any sense. It had that white substance in the middle of it. Um, we, you can see as we dug, we dug down around it. The weird thing about it is as we dug around it, we found no artifacts whatsoever. So we were really sort of surprised by that. But at the same time, we weren't because in most early 17th century sites, 
even at the home sites. There are very, very few archeological um, items that you'll find um, because they lived an incredibly organic life. You might find a little pottery, maybe a nail if you're lucky, but really in bones maybe, that's, that's pretty, pretty much it. Well, as we continue to dig, let's see, whoops, I'm gonna go back to this. So we continued to dig and, and explore this. Um, we took a sample of that white substance that you see, that it's a white chalky substance. And we had it tested in a lab down in Philadelphia to see exactly what it was. And we were shocked when we found out. What it was is what is, it's called daub. It's a mixture of clay, some sort of fiber. Sometimes it's animal hair. Sometimes it's um, pieces of uh, plant matter, um, shell, ground shell, um, sand. Um, and it creates like a, almost like a concrete, a plaster, right? And Europeans at this time, because they had so little wood, would build, especially the peasants, and, the, and even the more wealthy people would bu build walls that were built out of a, a timber frame. And between the two timbers, upright timbers, they would uh, weave um, sticks, which were called wattle, almost like a, um, it's like a basket-like look to it, right? And then they would take this daub when it was wet and plaster it over it. So at the end, you'd have this nice, solid white wall. And uh, I've only seen daub in one place here in Connecticut, and that's in a, a house in um, Guilford that, that was built in 1642. There's a little, little piece of it still up in the attic, which is really kind of cool. So when we found out that this was daub, this meant, hey, this is European. This means Europeans built, uh, built this thing. And as we dug down into a part of it and went down through it, we found the, uh, in archeology, span wood really doesn't survive very long in the dirt, but you can tell by what you find that it's like a shadow of what the, where the dirt was. The color of the dirt is different. And what we found underneath the daub was basically a, what was once a wooden sill. So this meant that the Europeans had built this, this strange sort of shaped building. We weren't sure what it was for. Um, we were reluctant at first to dig into it simply because we were so shocked by what it was or surprised, I should say. We did a lot of research around it. There, there we are working hard. And of course, the, the, uh, the person on the right there, that's our favorite archeological position. <laughs> Any archaeological dig, you're going to see at least one person, but uh, that's the way that goes. So there's me, yours truly, if you can identify me, but I'm going to quickly. We started to investigate and um, we started to find out that the English military, when they, at one point, they invaded Puerto Rico and we're going to take it over from the Spanish. You know how the Europeans were fighting over all these islands, right? And we found this little this little, um, this map of the English fortification that they built in Puerto Rico. And then on the far right side here, we found these circular sort of things. And it just so happened that the people, John White, who was one of the founders of the Raleigh colony in, in Virginia was with them. And he wrote a, an account of, of this fort. And one of the things he talked about was they were building these round structures. Uh, we thought they were tents, but you know they may. He seemed to indicate that they were a little more substantial. So we said, okay, maybe that's what it is. You know, and the English and Dutch are familiar with each other; they do the same sort of thing. And as we did more research, we found that the Dutch in New Netherland, up and down the Hudson River, occasionally would also build structures that were octagon in shape. So we started to think, okay, this is this is helping us out a lot. Um, this map um, is really also sort of an exciting one simply because, and I'm going to get into a, a closer view of it. This map was, um, came from an atlas, a sea atlas that was um, put together by an Italian engraver based on the, the sea charts of an English privateer. His name was Sir Robert Dudley. 
um, no relation to Dudley. Like that. That's that's okay. Um, we still love him anyway. And he sailed all around the New World, the Caribbean, South America, North America, he even went as far as India, Africa, and he amassed all these charts of where he went. He gave these charts to this Italian engraver. It took the Italian engraver making uh, copper plates um, 15 years to actually make all these maps so that they could be published. And the thing was, it was, it was published in 1645. If you subtract 50, excuse me, 13 years from 1645, you get the year 1632-ish, 1633. Uh, anybody know when the English first came to Connecticut? Well, New Haven, 1638. Okay, Saybrook Fort, 1635. Um, Weathersfield is 1634-ish. Windsor is 1633-ish. Um, so this is actually predates really the um, the um, arrival of the English here. But, oh, this, I forgot I have this little explanation here. But the thing that's really cool about this, this is a sort of a blown up version, is that he identifies all these different sort of um, spots. Uh, um, here's Manhattan, for example. And on Manhattan, there's this little item here which and his on his maps this little thing here that indicates a fort okay on all his maps no matter where they are and then here you have long island sound here he's identifying some of the native people here's the he's trying to say quinnipiac or whatever quirkies whatever it is but sudden you get over to here too and it's identified once again as red dunes okay and guess what's there one of those little fort signatures, okay? And then he, he draws this very curious sort of dotted thing of, around here. And I'm so happy your president mentioned how precarious it must have been to sail this part of, of, um, of uh, Long Island Sound because between the, you know, all the small islands, the shoals and all the rocks that are under the water, an incredibly dangerous place to sail. How did Robert Dudley know this? Well, Robert Dudley was a privateer. A privateer was somebody who your government gave you a license to pirate other country ships, okay? And obviously he was familiar with this area enough to know not only where the Dutch fort was, but also how dangerous it was to go into that little, into the Branford, mouth of the Branford River there by, by indicating what he did there. And so it makes it really sort of interesting to realize that uh, for the most part, the Dutch and the English got along. Um, and, you know, you guys all know the story, the Plymouth people went to Holland, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. They, they, were, they were fellow um, Protestant Christians taking on all the rest of Catholic Europe for the most part. And so they were, you know, they, though they were at, very often at odds, they were also very much um, brothers in, 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 in efforts when it came to this. So when we saw this map, we said, oh my gosh, this really puts us in a really interesting time period. Uh, this is definitely pre-1633. And we started pulling out artifacts. Now, eventually we blew into that white dog Thing simply because we we knew we had to. So we, we closed our eyes, took a shovel and found a spot and started to dig. And we started to find artifacts, not a lot, but artifacts. One of the first ones we found was a copper, um, copper button. And we were interested in this copper button because it was um, had no decoration on it. It was very same, plain, very simple. The kind of button that like a regular old seaman, seaman would, have, would have had, or maybe a soldier. And you can see the size of it compared to a penny. 
Then we found this. This is a piece of pottery. And from the historic archaeology point of view, neither John or I had ever seen anything like it. It was, the design was really, really different. The, um, the substance, the material that it was made of was a little different. It wasn't your common type of pottery that you were, that Europeans were using that came out of England, um, Holland or the Netherlands and Germany. And so we said, okay, this is, this is kind of strange, especially the markings. And the second year digging, guess what? We found more which was really sort of interesting. We said, okay, this is, this is, this is going to be something that we're not used to seeing. And that some of the pieces actually fit, fit together. So John, during the winter, when we weren't digging, um, started to contact different experts on, on early um, pottery in America. And um, both experts agreed that this was not, European, other than it may have come from southern Spain, based on the um, uh, the material that when they looked under the microscope of the actual pottery itself, um, there were chips of um, silica and stuff that was common to southern Spain. The design was completely and totally Arabic. And one of the things that we soon realized in, in terms of a lot of our research is that the Dutch by then had, 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 as I said earlier, had created this global trade network. And they were not only trading with people in the Middle East, they were trading with people all around the world. And um, one of the experts in particular who since passed away had done analysis of pottery at the Dutch fort outside of Albany. And she found examples of pottery that came from an excess of 30 different countries. So, you know, that helped us sort of say, okay, maybe we do have some Spanish Arabic pottery here, which is kind of, kind of cool. We also found this, and we weren't really sure what it was. Until we started to do a little more research, we ran it by, you know, people who were experts in the type of weaponry they would have had in those days. And it turns out it was a fragment of one of these, a pike. A pike was a standard military weapon, not only for foot soldiers, because it, this, is, this is back in the day when they had those big blunderbuss sort of muskets that took 20 hours to load and it shot once and then, then it was too heavy to, to, to hold up. And you had to have a special tripod thing to hold it up, et cetera, et cetera. So most soldiers would rather have this. Um, and also, on ships, this was a standard, standard weapon. We also found, um, these are just some examples of, of shell now, and uh, beads. Now the shells on the left-hand side are um, bead shells that were being worked to become wampum beads, but had, were never finished. The one on the left-hand side is, is from a, um, the column or Carmela of a whelk shell. And the one on the right side is uh, a piece from a, um, a cohawk shell. Now, one of the things I wanna make sure you, you understand is that when the Europeans first came here, um, they would find oysters that were two feet, two feet long, okay? Welk shells that were well over a foot to two feet, clam shells that were, um, you know, anywhere from a foot or a foot or more. Um, it's, it's, so they, you know, they they were working with shells that we can't even imagine seeing anymore when it came to making these wampum beads. The other beads on the other side are really interesting because the one in the center is a copper, a copper bead. So I mean, that means obviously that's European. And then the four other ones are glass beads, black glass beads. And we brought these over to Kevin McBride over at, at that point, he's from Yukon, but at that point he was director of archeology span at the Pequot Museum. And uh, he immediately identified them. He looked at them within 10 seconds and said, oh yeah, Dutch, those are Dutch trade beads. You know, so that was really kind of cool that 
that because in the beginning he was one of the skeptics about what we found, which is the way archaeologists fly anyway. They, they, they doubt everything that anyone else ever finds. And this is just an example, you know, just to kind of show you, um, you know, the purple as opposed to the uh, the white. Um, we did find pipe stems, but not the actual pipe barrels themselves. But it's actually better to find the pipe stems because based on the thickness of the, in the, the, of the hole that goes through the stem, you can actually date them. And the pipe stems that we found were pre-1620. So that was also kind of a cool a diagnostic thing. And this is just kind of showing you, okay, as we kept going digging in the in the next year, um, this is obviously where that, that building was. We continued to put test pits in, trying to look for, okay, if this is a port, we gotta find the wall somewhere, right? And so we kept looking and looking and looking. And finally here, we came through a cross, what was a cross section of a, of a ditch, which was very indicative of the possibility of a port. That's on the Bentley side over here. We then went over onto the Oenigo side and we found the same exact thing here and here and here. And this is the old cistern that was found. And we also found large post molds here. Now post mold is a, um, once again, a shadow of a uh, wooden post that's since rotted away, but it leaves a, a dirt stain that's different than the surrounding dirt. So you know that that's where a, a, a post was put. And here we are once again, digging and digging and digging. The second summer, 1999, was one sort of like this past one, incredibly dry and incredibly hot. And in the beginning of that summer, we started off with a crew of 30 people. Within two weeks, guess what? <laughs> we were down to about six or seven. So it was, it was great. And you can see the guy on the far, uh, on the far left there just passed out. But you can see me still working because I know the picture is being taken. This is an example of those post holes that I was talk talking about. And at first we were kind of curious about exactly what, what they represented because they were much more massive than you would have, say, if they were for a, struck, a building or, or you know, a house or a storage building. And the more we dug, the more we started to realize, well, they formed a certain pattern. And then we also found the remains of what was obviously um, a, a trench. And now in this picture, I can walk you through a little bit. Um, see the darker, the darker stain that you see here? This is what we call fill. So what had happened was this trench was dug, the dirt was thrown up here, um, and then later on, once the fort was abandoned and the property changed, the dirt was thrown back in. So you can see the difference in terms of color. And I'll explain why this types of trenches like this were important. This is even a better example. So you can really see a good, a good example of, of the difference in terms of the stratigraphy and the darkness of, that, um, of the fill that had once represented the trench. This is standard um, National Geographic <laughs> interpretation of what a fort at this time period would have looked like. And we thought this was a great example to show you. And the only difference was this. For us, what would have happened is they would have dug a trench in front of this wall, thrown the dirt up, built a wooden wall, and then the person would stand on top of that. Okay, and be able to shoot down or shoot out around it. And the whole idea of having a trench in front of your wall is because if somebody's going to attack you and try to climb up the wall, all of a sudden, oops, they're down lower, and it makes a big difference. And it's much easier to defend yourself if you're higher than who's ever attacking you. And this seems to be a standard Dutch and Euro European thing in, in the New World in general. We also found what appeared to be, you know, I'm convinced actually, I can't really say appeared to be a, an abutment or a, where the walls seemed to come together, there was a bath, what we now call a bastion. It was a squared area that had those big post molds in it. 
and it most likely was raised and held the cannon and it would face directly at the water. And the thing that would have been interesting is um, anybody sailing and trying to get through all those tricky sort of rocks and, and things out there in the islands uh, would face this cannon and boom, there you go. Okay, and this this was literally about 15 feet from the edge of the, uh, the property overlooking the ocean, the water. So as we continue to open it up, this is sort of what it looked like, you know, sort of like the Sahara Desert in a way, but um, the bastion is actually, turns out to be right here. This is after we had sort of excavated it just to make sure. Here's some of those post molds still too here. Here's a cross section of, of a of section that we thought was the, was the wall. On the other side, this is that big hedge. On the other side is the Omigo, where we found some really, really good examples of the, uh, of the trench that would have formed the wall here. So what the basic shape of this was, the, um, it was sort of like a triangle facing the water with the walls going off at an angle. Um, sort of like this. This is a artist's rendition of down at Williamsburg. I mean, excuse me, Jamestown. And though ours wouldn't have looked like this, it was probably about the same size and roughly the same shape, um, which means, okay, so why can't, why didn't we find more over here? Well, here's the, here's the, um, tri the, uh, property line with the bushes running right through here. Here's our, our building would have been there. We found this part of the wall here. The problem over this area when we were digging was the fact that it had been completely disturbed by um, by the construction of the Bentley's house because I guess in the 1940s, the original house there burned down and the Bentley's house was um, was constructed. And at the time when the house was constructed, you know, they moved a lot of dirt around and obviously obliterated what was, still part of the wall there. And this just goes to show you, this is the section of the bastion before we got into it a little bit more, but you can see the post molds. We found, I think, four or five examples of these pieces of stone. Now, most people say, hey, that's just stone. Yep, you're right, just stone, but it's a special stone. It's European gun flint because they would have had to have um, use these gun flints because their their guns at that time had to hit flint. They had a steel trigger that went down and hit flint that made a spark that lit the lit the gunpowder right. And we had these dated. And you want to know where they came from? One came from Belgium. Another one came from the Netherlands, and another one came from northern Germany. So that was pretty kind of cool. Um, and then we found examples of lead shot. These, these are just the can of, um, the, the musket balls. And then we actually didn't find this, which made us sad. But one of the people who came to um, kind of uh, cheer us on said, you know what I got? Found in my yard, put it in my garden. And we said, what? I got a cannonball. We said, you've got a cannonball? He said, oh yeah, I got a cannonball. We well, lived about... 300 feet away from the fort. And he brought it over and said, hey, you want it? And there it is. So there's, a, and then we checked it you know, in terms of the size and stuff. This is standard naval warfare cannonball stuff from that time period. Um, it's solid metal, solid iron, and it's very heavy. So here's our still working theory. What were they doing in Brantford, the Dutch? Well, we know they may have come here to trade for beaver um, furs and otter furs, which really takes off after the 1620s. But we didn't see a lot of evidence of that. We're 90% convinced that they were there for two reasons. Number one, to cut and process timber, not only for the fisheries up in the, off in Newfoundland, but also um, to send timbers back to the Netherlands, which was very timber, timber poor. Um, we had, we since have found record 
that across the Branford River, where the Mill River comes in to the Branford River, was a site of an early English sawmill. So in 2000, we went there and we tried to dig and we got down to seven feet and it got was constantly flooded and we couldn't go any farther. But we were pretty sure that that was the site of probably that early Dutch um, Dutch mill. We found, you know, colonial type debris. We found lots and lots of sawdust, et cetera, et cetera. But meanwhile, doing research, we found that when the English came to, to New Haven Harbor in 1638 and then negotiated to, to uh, with the Totucket to sort of take over them, those settlers didn't actually come here until 1644, there were already three Europeans living here. They were all Englishmen. They had been resident here for a very long time. The leader was a man by the name of Milner. His ancestry was, he did come from England, but he came from a section of England that had been populated by a lot of Dutch people around Ipswich. And so our working theory was that Milner was here working for the, um, we're working for the Dutch um, in, in, in the timbering operation. The English in New Haven, the Puritans, when they got here, hated this guy. There's constant court records of them pulling him into court, saying, "You're causing trouble. You're doing this. You're doing that. You know why? You know, why? Why are you drinking rum?" I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And then finally, in the late 1650s, they buy him out. He claims he has the right to stay there because he had traded and bought land, which is still to this day Milner's Point, from the native people. And he said, "That's my property. You can't, you can't expel me just because you decided it was yours." And they finally ended up buying him out when he was a, a, quite an older guy. But it's really fun to look at the New Haven Colony records and realize this guy was a real thorn in the in the butt for the the people who settled here. I, I kind of get a kick out of him, um, and so that's our work in theory here. I think the other issue is this: starting in sixteen the early sixteen twenties, the Dutch turned their efforts to really big time to um, fur trade, okay? Because men's hats made out of beaver fur was like all the rage in Europe. And you guys, you know how you have to have your hat, right? So um, um, they went into it wholeheartedly. They worked out a deal with the Pequots where the Pequots would dominate all the other native people in return for guaranteeing them a supply of wampum. And in return, the Dutch would trade with the Pequots the European goods and the year and the, and then the European Pequots would distribute them to the other native people. So that's happening starting in 1622. We, because of that, and because of the paucity of any sort of indication about fur trade or whatever, because after 1622, the Dutch are pretty good about recording where they are, not only elsewhere, but in Connecticut here. And so um, we think that leads to the idea that this Dutch court was actually pre-22. We, uh, we had a, um, a gentleman, a, actually a scholar from the Netherlands, do research for us. His name was Jacques ja ja Jacobs. And he, um, he researched for two years. He couldn't actually find any documentation about this, this site. However, he said, based on the evidence, he's very comfortable with saying that this is probably sometime around 1611 to maybe 1620. We also know that there was an early Dutch company called the Greenland Company that was trading with the Native Americans here in the late 1590s. So it could even date back to the time period of the Greenland Company that was here in the 1590s. Uh, it would be great. We have a lot of people who've been working on the, the Dutch stuff now in Connecticut, not in Connecticut as much, but in New York. And it'd be great if we sometimes come up with some documentation that says, oh yeah, there was a Dutch fort in Brantford. But so far we haven't got the documentation, but the thing is we got the goods. 
And that's the thing that's so cool about us. So, so I want to congratulate you guys for the fact that um, you are in your home is the first place where Europeans actually lived among the uh, native people here, at least as far as we know at this point. And for us at the Dawnland Museum over at the Dudley Farm, it's really an important thing because we know then that the relationship between the indigenous people, the Quinnipiac, is when the Europeans is different than it is with the English and the other people, simply because they lived alongside the Dutch early on. And that plays into a lot of our interpretation about what happens to the Quinnipiac later on. So, um, so thank you very much.